So, project manager, you've defined everything you need to do in the scope statement, and you have your high-level, user-friendly work breakdown structure and activity list. But there's still a lot you don't know yet. In particular, you don't know how long these tasks will take, what order they will be performed in, which of the tasks can be completed independently, which require other activities to have already been completed, and which can be carried out in parallel with others. That's what the next few lessons will be focusing on. Timelines and schedules. There is a logical process the project manager should follow when planning timelines and schedules. First, they should estimate the durations of each activity or task, they should add buffers, then sequence the tasks, and finally, they will be ready to build the project timeline. Pretty logical, right? Now let's break these down. So, estimating the durations of activities to achieve the deliverables. There is no one way of approaching this, but here is some best practice advice. The project manager needs to estimate how many hours, days, weeks, months, or even years an activity will take. She or he can, and should, use the experts in their team to get the most accurate estimates possible. But it is ultimately their responsibility to make the final decision. They are, after all, the person accountable for the project's success. With that said, the project manager will often not take what her or his team says as the undeniable truth, without proofreading it first at least. So I bet you're wondering, but why even ask them in the first place if you're just going to estimate a different time? Well, let's look at an example. Meet Jimmy. Jimmy's manager asked him to estimate how long he takes to get from his home to the office in the morning. He has worked here for a while and always leaves his home at 8.30, so he answers confidently, half an hour. His manager asks him to go into more detail. Jimmy answers that it can take up to 40 minutes when the traffic is bad, but when there's none, he can make it to the office in 20. He considers these to be the minimum and the maximum amount of time it would take him, making 30 minutes the average, and therefore the most likely time he will arrive. Jimmy's idea of his journeys to work looks like a bell curve, or the normal distribution. His manager doesn't really think Jimmy's estimation is completely accurate, so he asks Jimmy to help him with a little experiment. Every day over the next week, Jimmy must record the minute of departure from his home and of his arrival to the office. Once the data is collected and reviewed, something quite interesting comes to light. Jimmy is not quite the punctual employee he thought he was. In fact, he made it to the office in less than 30 minutes only once. The data showed that on average, Jimmy takes 34 minutes to reach the office, over 10% his estimate. You had better start setting your alarm a little earlier from now on, Jimmy. Now, this is an example of what we call planning fallacy and we are all susceptible to it. So next lesson, we'll discuss what exactly the planning fallacy is, why it occurs, and what good project managers do to counteract it. Awesome. Remember Jimmy from the previous lesson and the planning fallacy I mentioned? Of course you do. So let's discuss. Because, well, Jimmy isn't actually terrible at timekeeping or at least any more terrible than most people. So what exactly is it? Let's think about this for a minute. Jimmy says that 20 minutes is the minimum amount of time in which he can make it to the office. Let's trust Jimmy on that one. We can say that 20 is a solid minimum. No traffic, shortest route, and feathering the speed limit. Now, let's consider the maximum. Jimmy says the longest it could take him to get to the office is 40 minutes. But what if it's raining or snowing? Mondays usually have heavier traffic too. Did he think about this when estimating? What if Jimmy's searching for a parking spot around the office for 10 minutes? Now, less probable, but still possible. What if he meets a friend he hasn't seen in ages and they go for a quick coffee before work? 
What if he punctures a tyre? What if aliens invade? <laughs> there are many things that may slow him down. Even if they aren't as probable as just getting stuck in a traffic jam, they are still possible, and if taken into account, will affect the range Jimmy originally estimated. So with this new knowledge in mind, we need to readjust the graph we made last time. All these possible slowdowns he forgot when doing the estimation need to be added to the right of our graph, so it reflects reality better. If you look at the graph now, you will notice that 40 minutes is really nowhere near the maximum time it could take Jimmy, so if you stretch the graph to account for the delays Jimmy could have, as well as the likelihood of those things happening, it will look something like this, with the average time of Jimmy's journey sitting further to the right also. But like I said, this is not really Jimmy's fault. In fact, he's not the only one who fails to see things like this. It's general human behaviour. So why do humans fall for the planning fallacy? Let's discuss. The planning fallacy is a phenomenon in human behaviour discovered by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky in 1979, who stated that predictions are often wrong as people underestimate the actual time needed to complete a future task. They believe things will work out well, due to the optimism bias. The optimism bias is a term used to describe the behaviour whereby people believe they are less at risk of something than somebody else. Think of the age-old, I never thought it would happen to me. This is an almost universal cognitive function. Therefore, the optimism bias is an understandable reason why people neglect to think of every worst-case scenario when planning. Another factor impacting our ability to plan well is the illusion of control. This is just what it sounds like. In the broadest of terms, people often overestimate their ability to control events, focusing on the things they can control rather than the things they can't. Think of gambling behaviour, for example. When people participate in dice games, they tend to throw the dice harder for high numbers and softer for low, as if that's going to make any difference. Okay, so what this journey into human cognition teaches us is this. People are generally bad at planning, and they often fall victims to the planning fallacy, underestimating the time or resources they need to complete a task. So, let's get back to project management now. The project manager is the person who must be aware of these human biases. One effective way the project manager can try to make themselves aware of events that may slow a task down is to perform a SWOT analysis. So on top of taking all available opportunities and working off the strengths, a project manager can also limit weaknesses and protect against threats to creating a realistic plan. In conclusion, estimation takes a lot of deliberate thought and information. It's nowhere near as simple as Jimmy's first guess, right? And one last thing. If the project manager is really, really stuck, they can use the following formula. The three-point estimate. But remember, a project manager should rely on their skills and experience first. But if they need to, they can think of each task as having three time estimates. The optimistic time estimate we'll call O, the most likely or normal time estimate, we'll call M, and the pessimistic time estimate, P. The expected time, T, is estimated by putting the values into the following formula. Plug the numbers in, and you get a time estimate. Although the average is a good point to put an estimate, if you think about it, there is a 50% chance of finishing before our estimate, and 50% chance of going beyond it. So, would you feel comfortable presenting a project schedule and saying to the team in the kickoff meeting, We have about 50% chance of succeeding with the plan I have created? Probably not. So, that's where the next lesson comes in, where we will be talking about buffers. See you there. Things are chugging along nicely at this point. We have a work breakdown structure and activity list, 
We've got an estimation of their durations and we stuck some buffers on to cover our backs. Wow, way to go. But things do look a bit like an activity soup right now. We need to unjumble this mess and see how activities link with each other. In other words, we need to understand their dependencies. It's not hard to imagine how some tasks are dependent on others. You can't have the cars delivered without a showroom. And you can't build your showroom until you've started digging, and you can't start digging until you have the machinery on site. You can, however, start recruiting the sales team. So, let's look at the four main reasons why dependencies exist between tasks. First, logical dependency. This is just like what I described. You can't put windows in your showroom until you've built walls. Second, we've got resource constraints. Lack of resources can affect the sequencing of tasks. Let's say you have two work packages as part of your showroom project. One for performing a financial comparison between two potential interior designers, and another for preparing a detailed report on travel expenses. But you only have one business analyst, and nobody else qualified to perform the tasks. The two tasks cannot be completed simultaneously. Therefore, your business analyst has to finish one before they can start the other. Third, we have external dependencies. These can be anything from building work that needs to be signed off by the city, to paint work that can only be done in good weather. You get it. The activities that are affected by external sources. The fourth are called soft dependencies. These are applied by the project manager themselves, and could include things like a task not going forward unless the project manager has checked the previous task. They are called soft dependencies as they are easily amendable, due to the fact that the project manager set them in the first place. Now, let's have a look at the types of dependencies. Four, again, is the magic number here. First, we have Finish to start, where the second task cannot start until the first has finished. The task, paint the whole room, cannot start until you finish the task by paint. Second, there is finish to finish, where the second task cannot be finished until the first has been finished. The task, paint the whole room, cannot be finished before task, paint the fourth wall is fully finished. Third is start to start, where the second task can only start when the first starts. The task paint the whole room must start, so the task paint the first wall can also start. And lastly, the not as common start to finish, where the second task has to start before the first can finish. Let's step away from the painting examples for this one and imagine the construction site needs 24 hour security. Guard 2's shift must start before Guard 1's shift can finish. This way, there will be no interruption in the surveillance for any thieves to sneak in. As always, the project manager must take all these factors into consideration because any missed dependencies are sure to cause delays and increase costs. Once the project manager has worked out the dependencies, we can apply the critical path method we came across a couple of lessons ago to potentially find out the shortest time in which we can complete the project. So let's look at this next. Hey, time to have a look at the critical path method. It is one of the project manager's best tools when scheduling a project timeline. Let's jump to the Lamborari project and assume, because you're an awesome project manager, you have done everything you need to up to this point. And of course, you're still as cool as a cucumber. You have your list of activities and their durations with buffers. Bear in mind, this is a snippet of the activities that would be involved in a project. You will see that later things get very detailed. But in the interest of time, I will demonstrate what we need with a shorter list of activities. What you must do as a project manager is identify the longest chain of dependent activities required to complete the project. This is called the critical path. 
It is critical because delays to this path will certainly cause delays to the whole project. One of the best ways to plot the critical path is to put the information in a network chart with boxes and arrows. This works well because it shows all the tasks and all the durations in the boxes and all dependencies, the arrows, making it as easy as pie to chart a critical path. OK, using our work breakdown structure and activity list, let's begin. So. We have our four work streams, showroom construction, car selection and production, visual effects development, and staff recruitment and preparation. Each stream can be executed in parallel, starting with A, O, K, and M, respectively. Now let's see how each stream flows and how, or if, they intertwine. So, excavate foundations follows prepare land for construction works. Build foundation structure follows excavate foundations. Build showroom spaces follows build foundation structure, and so on. The majority of these are logical dependencies, but remember, there can always be resource, external, and soft dependencies to consider. For example, F, design interiors, must follow C, build foundation structure. These do not seem dependent. However, the chief engineer needs to participate in the design activities, although he will not have the available time before the main part of the construction is done. This makes it a resource constraint. There we have it. Now, as you can see, A through to I is the longest stream. This is the path you will need to be the most vigilant with. As any delay here will postpone the whole project, this is the critical path. With the non-critical paths, you have extra time, where a delayed task won't halt the overall timeline, and this is called a float. As you can see, the car selection and production stream has a float of two weeks. Therefore, if a task is delayed within this float, it won't affect the project directly. However, if there is a delay longer than the float, then this non-critical path becomes the critical path. Yes, that's right. The critical path is dynamic and can change during the project. So you will need to monitor it carefully as the work progresses. What you've done here is a major step to creating the project schedule. But there's one more thing you can do to further help yourself, and that is by making a Gantt chart. And next lesson, we'll be taking a good look at that. Thanks a lot. Wow, this project is really flying now. Remember last lesson when I said work streams could be executed in parallel? Of course you do. The thing is, this doesn't mean that they necessarily start at the same time. What we need is a way to list the activities in a way that we can see when they start and when they finish. Have your calendars at the ready, because here comes the Gantt chart. The one we mentioned way back in the history lesson, remember? The Gantt chart represents something very simple, yet extremely useful. It lists all the activities from our activity list on the y-axis of a table. A calendar with days, weeks, and months is positioned on the top of the table, the x-axis. The durations of the activities are drawn right below the calendar day. You can now see the start date and the end date, with the difference equaling the duration of the task. Do you see how easy it is to visualize our project activities now? Their duration, dependency, start, and end dates are also clear to see. For now, though, Let's look at how our activities fit into the chart. We'll start with the critical path. Makes sense, right? So A is our first task. That's the easy part. As the project manager, though, it's your job to decide when to execute the other streams. So think about this. M, recruit personnel, is a nice quick activity which you could start immediately, with N, the interview process, starting soon after. This means you could have the whole stream complete by week 11, but that leaves a long time before the showroom is set to open. 
What if the staff you hired and trained find other jobs, or they forget the training? Hiring more staff and training them will add time and cost to the project. So with that in mind, it seems that the best thing to do is to start the process at week 23, 11 weeks before the project is due to be completed, right? But what happens if we run into a situation like our non-straightforward task from a few lessons ago? Remember where our task of getting one candidate profile took four times longer than we estimated? Starting precisely 11 weeks before the project is complete means you won't have a buffer to account for a delay such as this. Your job as project manager will be to assess the risks and think of any potential problems that may occur with the scheduling. So for argument's sake, let's say we start with this path at week 18. For our project, this seems to leave us with an adequate buffer. This though is not an exact science. Each project manager must assess and determine their own schedule based on their experience and expertise. Now, let's see how we could fill in our chart. Hey, looks good to me. And the benefits of this chart are that you can see how all the activities fit together in a calendar and will help you form a strategy if there are any changes to the critical path. Okay, at this point, you should be well equipped to start scheduling the project. It's what all these methods have been building up to. So hold on to your hats and see you next lesson. With an amazing project plan like this, it's unlikely you'll miss any details. You've done all the work and thought of everything. But imagine a project stakeholder wants to know the progress of your project. So they take a look at the project plan and are faced with 1000 rows of tasks, all with their own status. They will near on have a heart attack. No way could they pinpoint any problems or see their impact quickly enough. We know senior managers do not have a lot of time. For this reason, we have the milestone table where all information is brought to a high level. With this, we can see key actions, deliverables and project milestones. The main stages of the project are written out as a reference point to check that the project is moving along as planned. A reason why having the critical path chart alongside is also a practical idea. So how about we show you what a milestone table could look like? Note that we said milestones. Milestones, as the name suggests, are important achievements throughout the project. They are marked with a zero duration on the milestone table. You can see here, main construction completed, personnel preparation completed, grand opening. These are some of the Lamborari project milestones. Awesome. We have officially covered everything a project manager will need when scheduling their project. So, to recap. A project manager starts by creating a work breakdown structure, separating the project into work streams, deliverables and work packages, and then assigns owners to said packages. This translates nicely into an activity list, but has little to no sequence. So the project manager works out all the dependencies and with that identifies the critical path. Awesome. Now, the project manager can use the Gantt chart to time the execution of tasks around the critical path. After all this is in order, the project manager will create the low level project plan and the high level milestone table. So this leaves the project manager with a project plan that tells them exactly what's going on and the Gantt chart and milestone table are so anyone can follow the progress of the project. Excellent. This brings us to the end of our timelines part of this course. Now is the time we move on to budgeting. We are about to see how a project manager controls costs and gets what they need in the most effective way. See you next lesson.